Hi, welcome again to Higher PhD's Alternative Career Path Success Story Series, or ACPSS. One of Higher PhD's Career Society's mission is to help talent with advanced degree navigate careers outside of academia. PhD and masters learn many transferable skills that can be applicable to many jobs and industries, but and not just your own thesis topic. However, the challenge is that in academia, we are not exposed to job options outside of academia. So this theory's objective is to showcase stories of people who have made it a successful transition outside of academia to a career path you might or might not know about. And we try to find speakers who you can relate to, who have gone through the struggles to make it to where they are today. So I hope today you'll come out to the the conversation today and feeling, yes, I can do it too. So I am very happy to have Dr. Leticia Hemphill here. And she is currently a freelancer editor. She has a PhD in English literature from the University of Toronto. Hi, I'm so excited to, to talk to you today. Hi, thanks for having me. So I guess I'll start with a common question like, Tell us about yourself. Yeah, um, I can start um, maybe in July 2014. Um, I was about 10 months away from finishing my PhD and I went on a camping trip in Massasauga Provincial Park in Ontario, uh, named after the only poisonous rattlesnake in Ontario. And during that camping trip, I had a pretty significant back injury. Um, it uh, left me with difficulty walking and in pain for, gosh, at least like two years afterwards. And so that back injury was followed uh, in relatively quick succession by pretty significant heartbreak and then a six week strike at the University of Toronto. Um, where all TAs and course instructors, including myself, went on strike for six weeks. And the culmination of those three pretty difficult life events and my own real anger at my institution as when I saw how they were treating us uh, during the strike, I felt that they were disingenuous. I felt that faculty members were you know, following by the rules of the university in a way that I felt they could have simply chosen to ignore the rules if they wanted to. And our uh, vice provost at the time, her name was uh, Jill Maidas. She was a faculty member in the English department who had written very empathetic portrayals of striking workers in Northern England in 1855. But the emails that she was sending out to the university had a lot less sympathy for the real humans who were on strike than she had for these fictional characters from 150 years before. And so I just felt that I was, it seemed hypocritical to me and I was quite angry. And, uh, and I burned out pretty hard around the time that I was submitting my PhD. Mm. I applied for exactly one academic job. It was for a visiting assistant professorship. It wasn't even uh, a tenure track job. And I submitted what I felt was a pretty strong application. I just won a big teaching award. I won the top teaching award at the university. Mm. And this university didn't even acknowledge that they'd received my application and I just felt no I was done mm -hmm. I was just really really done with being a part of this system I didn't mm -hmm. feel that academia was treating its humans well mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to uh, do a bit of research to see what other career paths might suit me I had done co-op in my undergrad and so I had some awareness of things that I could do to figure out what my profession might be. I did a lot of informational interviews, which I strongly recommend. And I asked people in those informational interviews some weirdly personal questions like, 
what is the best part of your day? And do you see yourself as a big picture person or a fine detail person? <laughs> because I knew what kind of person I was. And so I wanted to find a job that fit my personality. And that's how I learned about research grants facilitation. That is working within a university to help you know, uh, faculty members, to help researchers win grant funding. So still working in academia, but not in a research capacity, not in an English department, um, and not at the university where I did my PhD, because I was too angry at that university. Um, so I learned about this profession. I took a six month contract role in a vice provost office at a different university on the other coast. Mm -hmm. um, hated that job. It was not suited to my personality at all, but somehow it's a lot easier to find a job once you've got a job. So I found that having that six month position just opened every door for me and I started getting lots of interviews and I walked into a permanent job in a small health sciences department at the University of British Columbia where I edited research grants happily for uh, three years. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd always enjoyed teaching but I didn't like grading. Mm -hmm. I actually really, really struggled with grading. <laughs> I, I found it. <laughs> I felt like I was actually grading the person and not their work. I really struggled to, to separate mm. the work from the human beings who I knew. Mm. And it also, it took all of my time and all of my attention and it took all of my energy and I was left with no energy afterwards. I would just collapse on the couch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I found that working with faculty members and working with the same group of people for many years rather than a churn every four months in a new group of people, it kind of scratched the same itch as teaching. I was still being helpful. I was still instructing others. I still sometimes got to be in a classroom if I was supporting their graduate students, for example, giving talks about editing or uh, research grants perhaps, but uh, no grading. Mm. And that Not a fan of grading myself. <laughs> It was wonderful to leave that behind. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, one thing that I learned about myself is there are things that I enjoy doing where it doesn't matter what the content is. So it didn't matter that I wasn't talking about poetry anymore because I was still working with words and working with people. And that was great for me. Um, after three years in that role, I uh, did a big left turn and worked in uh, student support, but I kept a part-time position at the university. I didn't work full-time. And as I uh, was working part-time at the university, I slowly built my freelance business, my freelance mm -hmm. editing business. I primarily edit, but I also do a bit of teaching. I do some freelance writing. And this year I've started doing uh, research consulting. Uh, so doing research for money, turns out you can make a lot of money doing research consulting, even if your PhD is in poetry and you're not being hired to work on poetry, that's still okay. Um, and so at the beginning of this year, I transitioned to full-time freelance and I just love it. I love being in charge of my own schedule. I love uh, choosing what projects I'm working on. I love figuring out how I go about my work. And to be totally honest, like I still get deep intellectual engagement, creativity, play, and research. I get to do all the things that acad academics do, but I do it on my own terms without the politics of any institution. And uh, turns out when you own a small business, there's a lot of government money that gets thrown around that you can just get. And so last year I brought in, I think about $120,000 in grants 
for my own business. That's all money I had to spend. I couldn't just keep it for myself, but it is so easy because you're a business. And, and so you know how to write grants. No, I love <laughs> it. I love it. I love this kind of work. Oh, this, this is so amazing. I've always wondered, I tried a uh, consulting business for so long. I just, I really curious of how you kick it off. And I have so many questions for you. So first question is one of the, a little bit uh, specific is as an English person coming to edit grants of a scientific grant, how does that feel? Uh, it's no problem. It's really oh. not a problem. Um, I'm not editing nanochemistry. I don't know if that's a real field. I'm not editing um, advanced materials. I'm not even editing economics. So I'm not editing grants that have complex statistics that I don't understand or mathematical equations that I don't understand. But I absolutely can edit in the health sciences. I can edit in education. I can edit in the social sciences. I don't even actually edit in the humanities that much because my experience, people in the humanities already think they're great writers. And so uh, they don't know how much help they need. But it's absolutely no problem to read and support uh, research grants outside of your traditional discipline. Does it take you some? Oh, sorry, I cut you off. Oh, yeah, what I was going to say was like, when I studied poetry, I was really good at both actual words in the poems, but also the different types of poems. Is it a sonnet? Is it an epic? Is it a rondelle? Is it a ballad? And it turns out that editing research grant applications and journal articles and tenure and promotion dossiers and book manuscripts, these are just genres in the same way that poems can have different genres or novels mm -hmm. can have different genres. And so once I learned the conventions of the genre, mm -hmm. I'm an excellent research grant editor because I'm doing two dozen of them every year. Mm -hmm. Academics only write two a year. Yeah, you read way this. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it's it was it was definitely like I had to learn a lot, um, but it wasn't outside of my ability to understand because I'm not providing them feedback on the quality of their proposed research. That's their job. My job is to make it fit the shape and make it persuasive. Mm. It's um, it's such a common thing that we hear from our our speakers is that when you jump outside of the field, like me, I'm in neuroscience and now I'm in project management in a gaming company. It's like those transferable skill and and the PhD itself, a master itself, that what it teaches us is how to learn fast. And for you to be able to learn fast and then able to understand the scientific health health content is no problem. Like you you verified, right? We learn we learn quickly. Mm -hmm. We're really good at working independently. We don't need a lot of like external pushing to get our work done. We're ambitious. We work hard. Like people with graduate degrees, I have so much more optimism for your careers after graduation then i know that many of you feel for yourselves because i have worked with people who've transitioned out of uh out, out of the academy i've worked with lots of people with graduate degrees i have so much confidence in your brilliance and your determination uh i hope that you can find a way to find that confidence as well Thank you. That's just so touching. And another question I have is you were talking about research consulting. I'm sure that is such an interesting field that many, many of you want to be in. And can you tell us more about that? Sure. So uh, research consulting, I have done exactly three projects. OK, this is not like a huge part of my business, but they are really lucrative. And so I definitely encourage people to consider looking into research consulting. 
So uh, I'll share the links afterwards, but there's a, a, a website called Merck's, M -E -R -X .com. It's a paid uh, subscription, but it brings together all the different provincial and federal platforms where all kinds of different hiring for consulting takes place. And by all kinds of different, I mean all kinds of different. They will have calls for proposals for people to monitor for bears in a particular forest, and they will have calls for proposals for revamping the bathrooms in a particular city in Northern Ontario, and they will have calls for proposals for research work. And this research work will often be, uh, sometimes they're called knowledge syntheses, mm -hmm. or it might be for instructional design, mm -hmm. or it might be develop a teaching program. So I was looking at Merck's just the other day on a random Monday in April, and I saw multiple calls for proposals for research consulting related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is an area where lots of graduate students in the social sciences and humanities especially will have both lived experience and scholarly expertise. If you know how to teach, especially if you were involved in teaching online during COVID, then I would encourage you to figure out how you can submit an expression of interest to put your hat in the ring to get one of these research consulting contracts. Uh, like I said, I've done three of them now. Um, one of them was about an area related to some previous work that I'd done at the University of British Columbia. So it was inside of my area of expertise. So that's not one I can really speak, speak to because I got it through networks and yada, yada, yada and drew on my knowledge. The one that I'm completing right now, it's about information communication technology, policy and sustainable business practices. I remind you, <laughs> my degree is in late 19th century poetry. I know nothing about any of these three things, but I know how to run a project. I know how to find research literature, and I was able to hire subject matter experts, people who do have expertise in these areas, through some of that free grant money that it's really easy to get once you have a business number, um, and those subject matter experts helped me to understand the literature. Mm -hmm. So I sent the draft report off for uh, the think tank that I'm writing this report for. I sent it to them. It's the knowledge synthesis report. It says, you know, here's what the literature of the past 13 years says about this subject. And uh, they loved the draft. And they said, yeah, for the final conclusion, uh, maybe can you present it in a table? Thanks mm -hmm. very much. And so really like for those PhD students that I hired and one master's student that I hired, they weren't just bringing their transferable skills, they were bringing their knowledge, their actual mm. knowledge from their discipline and applying it to a problem that somebody else has identified. Me, I brought project management, understanding how to read scholarly research from outside of my field and bit of writing and editing. And that project is going to represent between 10 and 15% of my income for this year, my gross income for the year. Oh, the and whole so, year. That is insane. <laughs> so um, research consulting is, mm -hmm. it's not a field, well, mm -hmm. put it this way, self-employment is dramatically underrepresented amongst people with PhDs, especially mm -hmm. here in Canada. In Canada, in, according to a 2021 report by the Council of Canadian Academies, the number of people with PhDs who are self-employed is 6%. The what? national average is 15%. Yeah. So huge untapped potential mm -hmm. amongst people with graduate degrees doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. we're, a, we're capable. Like you, totally the story, capable. yeah, you, it's so encouraging to hear like how you did it. Cause I know myself, you, you heard that. Oh, I'm trying to start this, but I have this mental block. I don't know what it is that I just 
didn't didn't really go super forward on it and i was like oh i'm gonna get a salary job and make sure i'm i'm secure you know look it's no no knock in the salary salary job salary job is a great idea after you've been underpaid in graduate school for too long as an adult it is wonderful to have some retirement savings you know maybe a, a little vacation some mm -hmm high quality um, health and dental benefits, maybe you can actually get a massage. I am <laughs> never gonna knock those things. Um, but for me, working part-time, mm -hmm. I was three, four days, a, I was four days a week for a number of years. That gave me one day a week to start up my own thing, get my own thing mm -hmm. going, build a little fire. And now that fire is, burning away I don't know why I went with a fire metaphor <laughs> now that fire excitement is, it's putting off heat and warmth and light mm -hmm. and um I don't see myself going back to being employed by somebody else not anytime soon I really love it that like it's getting some we all need security right after all that huge student debt and then 10 years of poverty oh, and oh. right yeah. and then have a job, sure, and then, but think, work on it on the side until it grows up and then you can switch over. Yeah, those those health benefits can also get you a lot of therapy, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's very true. I'm definitely enjoying my, my massage there with my company health insurance. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. that's great. And, I just, I, uh, I, I wanna encourage, um, I wanna encourage people with PhDs to think about maybe trying to run your own business, whether that's freelance, whether that's editing, writing, or I really think research consulting just has a, a lot of potential to be lucrative, interesting, intellectually engaging, um, and totally within the scope of our abilities. Mm -hmm. and so uh, if we can just figure out what research consulting kind of means and looks like, for me, it looks like writing reports or designing courses. Hmm. Cool. This is so far exciting. So then the common question will be like, how does your typical, typical day looks like living your life? Yeah, um, I have learned uh, in the past month or so that I, my body responds really well to an early start. So I now roll out of bed at about 6.25, put on my bathrobe and sit on that couch over there because I like to work from my couch with a cup of coffee and a bit of yogurt. And I work from 6.30 to 9.30. And that three hours of work, I focus on billable work. So stuff that I'm earning money for. And it's really lovely to start the day before any emails come in, before I have meetings because even as a freelancer, quite a few meetings. Um, I love getting a solid chunk of work done early. Take a break from 9.30 to 10.30. Um, that's on a good day. On a good day, I take a break from 9.30 to 10.30. On a not so good day, I have meetings. Um, but on a good day, like tomorrow, I'll take a break from 9.30 to 10.30. Maybe go outside if the weather's decent or putter around in my apartment, do some laundry, something like that. And then 10.30, I start and I do another three hours. And then my workday is ideally done at 1.30. And oh. it turns out that that rhythm works really well for me. It means that I have time to make some food or get some exercise, um, do some grocery shopping at 1.30 in the afternoon when the grocery store is not busy. Mm. Things like that work really well for me, but not everybody needs to start work at 6.30 in the morning. That's not everybody's dream. It just turns out it works well for me. Um, the other thing that I find with mm. the work that I do, I would say, you know, the majority of my income comes from editing. It comes from doing work in other people's documents. And when I'm doing that kind of work, it's really easy for me to get into flow it's really easy for me to lose track of time, forget the world outside of my computer screen and just become deeply engrossed in what I'm doing. And that feeling is lovely. 
It, mm -hmm. it, it means that I'm really enjoying myself. And I feel that having done this kind of work for six years now, mm -hmm. I've got mastery. I really know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. There's always a point when I'm reading a document. So I read it through once and then I start doing the edits on the second pass. And there's a point in that first read through where everything just clicks into place. And I say, I'm gonna do this and this and this. And I know exactly the changes I need to make and it becomes a matter of implementing them. Mm. And I write my email to the client and I tell them what I've done and uh, send the stuff off. And it's really personally rewarding to be doing work that you're great at, that you can lose yourself in mm. that you enjoy. And have time for cooking and exercise <laughs> and grocery shopping that I cannot dream of <laughs> yeah. in my day. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah sounds dreamy. Look, I, I don't yeah. want to pretend that there aren't busy times. There are definitely mm. busy times. I have absolutely worked weekends. Mm -hmm. And when I was working my part-time job and working for myself part-time, I definitely got into overwork. Mm. But now that I'm in full-time freelance, I feel like I've figured out a pattern that works well for who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And it's really uh, a lovely feeling. Um, I have so many like recommended strategies for people who want to freelance. And so mm -hmm. what I'll say is like, if anyone uh, who watches this video wants to have a coffee with me, I have a virtual coffee sign up on my website. I'll share the link with you. I would love to sit down with you over coffee, have a little discussion and help you to figure out how do you know whether or not freelancing or owning a small business, running a small agency, being part of a worker owned cooperative, how do you know if that's the right fit for you? Mm -hmm. It's an individual question. It's a great right. So that kind of leads to my next question. Actually, next school question, I'll throw it over. One is, what would you say the pros and the cons of the area, like if you want to sum it up for general people, I guess. And then I, I know I, when I talked to you before, you showed me a bunch of resources that you have on your website. I want to take a peek. Sure. Um, pros and cons. I think I've spoken to the pros a lot already that mm -hmm. it's intellectually enriching. It can be lucrative. Um, it's uh, rewarding, fulfilling, enjoyable. The cons, I mean, I spent a lot of time on that couch. It's sedentary work, so you really have to be careful, especially as you get older, to uh, keep your body healthy, to move around a lot. Um, oh, I just cracked my back as I was saying <laughs> that. I told you I had a big back injury. Mm -hmm. I have to be careful to not be too sedentary because it's really easy to get absorbed in your work. Um, other cons, I suppose, um, I don't have any coworkers. Um, so for some people that would be a disadvantage. I address that con by being really involved in my professional associations. I'm a member of Editors Canada and through Editors Canada, we have a joint uh, academic editing chapter that's run with the Editorial Freelancers Association in the States. And I run our book club, our equity, diversity, inclusion, and access subcommittee, and our advocacy subcommittee. So I meet a lot of my colleagues through that volunteer work. Mm. Um, and I'll share a blog post as well about um, why I think volunteering for your professional association is a great idea if you go into freelancing. Mm. I had one more con. Oh, I suppose it's the obvious one. The obvious con is uh, I don't get a paycheck that shows up in my account every other week or twice a month. I have to provide my own health uh, uh, plan. And that's huge if you're in a country that doesn't have um, taxpayer funded health care like we do here in Canada. Um, own retirement plan is necessary. So you need to be comfortable marketing your business mm. and uh, you need to be able to control your own finances. Mm. For me, that's a pro as well as a con because I'm earning more money 
as an independent business owner than I am, than I did when I was working for someone else. Um, but it's something that you have to be okay with. Um, a lot of people become okay with not having a regular paycheck by having a partner who has a regular paycheck. I am not in that situation. I'm a single woman who lives by herself and it's absolutely doable. That That is very encouraging. Yeah. yeah. And, um, oh yeah, so either we can, you wanna take a peek at your website? Can you tell sure. us more about your your? I have like I've been working on. four websites right now. I don't know. Um, let me think about what's the best order for me to share things in. Um, let me start. Well, maybe I'll start here. So this is University Affairs, and this is the column that I write for University Affairs. University Affairs is like the Canadian Inside Higher Ed or the Canadian Chronicle of Higher Education. And I've been writing my column there as Dr. Editor for four and a half years. This is the main way that I market my business. This is how people find out about me. And it just so happens that I get paid to write this column. Um, so I am paid to market my own business. It's a fantastic uh, approach to doing that kind of thing. And I strongly recommend content marketing as a strategy for people who are thinking about going into their own business. Look at all the stuff that I've written about, how compelling op-eds work, how to write about research methods, three tips for crafting a great teaching uh, philosophy statement. These were all really fun for me to learn about in order for me to articulate them. So we'll start with Ask Dr. Editor. The next thing I'll share is antihustle.ca. Uh, I've been talking about running your own business and I've been using the word lucrative a lot. I do wanna say that, you know, I don't really love capitalism. <laughs> I'm not the world's biggest fan of, um, you know, structural inequality and uh, exploitation. And so it's my belief that people with uh, graduate degrees, especially graduate degrees in disciplines that come with skepticism of systems like capitalism, mm -hmm. we have a lot to bring to the private sector and we can have discussions about what it means to run a good business or a successful business. Um, and so through Anti Hustle, which is a not-for-profit that I tried to start up, didn't successfully start up, is now fallow, and maybe I'll try again another time. Um, we talk about the different kinds of capital that your business can accrue. It can accrue mm -hmm. financial capital, sure, but what about intellectual capital, environmental mm -hmm. capital, uh, mm -hmm. spiritual or cultural capital? What about uh, interpersonal capital? These are all things that we can work to gain through our business and ways that we as individuals can be wealthy. Mm. This is my main website. This is Writing Short is Hard. Writing Short is Hard is the name. Of the oh, business. it is so true. <laughs> Why did I name my business with a sentence? Look, mm. I don't know. I just did. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this website has a ton of resources under training and resources. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are thinking about getting into editing, you can check out the resources for academics. Uh, I've got some courses. I've got this ridiculous tool called Writing Well is Hard. That's mm -hmm. another part of my um, marketing strategy. And it allows you to compare your text mm -hmm. to a reference of your choice. Oh. so that we're not saying that there's one way to write well. Mm. We're not using Ernest Hemingway as the only example of a good writer in English and everyone has to write like him. Mm -hmm. Instead, you choose what an example of good writing looks <gasps> like and then you wow. compare the features of your writing to that writing sample and it gives you tons and tons of information so that you can edit your document wow. to make it sound and have some of the qualities of your reference text and so you know how much passive voice does your reference learn use and should oh you i need this <laughs> and 
there's little question marks that remind you what the passive voice even is or why it matters. There's just a ton of information in um, Writing Well is Hard that, again, I didn't make this on my own. I don't know how to code. Mm -hmm. I had help to make this. And mm -hmm. I got that help because I have a business number and that mm -hmm. business number gives you free money. Oh, we got to get those links too. It shouldn't, but it does. Yeah. Um, what else can I share with you? I'll share you uh, share with you. Um, here's a free hour long webinar for people who are interested in getting into in house research grants editing. It explains um, why in house research grants editing even is a profession, um, and what it gives some of my strategies for things to say in interviews, and if you do get this job. How do you protect yourself in the workplace? Mm. So that's free. I've got this one hour long webinar, again, free, um, called Edit Your Resume for In-House Work. It's got sample um, job descriptions and resumes that go with those job descriptions. Kim and Emma are fake people. I can't remember which one is which because I delivered this <laughs> webinar three years <laughs> ago. But one of them is a, a recent grad starting out and one of them's, I believe, a former teacher who's doing a career transition. So mm. there are different ways you can format your resume for editing, go into that. Uh, I do have some resources that I charge money for. Them for. Mm -hmm. One is this course, Transitioning into a Career in Editing, a micro oh, nice. for PhDs. Mm -hmm um here's all of the stuff about it the mm. course is designed to help you figure out if editing is the right fit for you mm. but to be honest the only reason why i charge money for this course is because i want it to be something that people are invested in completing mm -hmm. and if i give away everything for free then people assume that that knowledge doesn't have value yeah, that's right. Charge for that because I want you to say, no, no, this is valuable. Invest some time in it, invest some money in it. But I'm very happy, like this conversation, to give away a lot of knowledge for free and mm -hmm. to chat with people about their career transitions. If they're thinking about freelancing, whether that's mm -hmm. editing or writing or doing something like consulting. Yeah, this so, is so lovely to hear. Tons of stuff on my website will figure out a way to get all the links below. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's a lot out there. Um, but I do really, really suggest conversations with people, mm. informational interviewing. That's the mm -hmm. formal term for having a coffee with someone. Because then you can ask the very specific personal questions that are about you and how you like to work and whether or not you like to start your day at 6.30 or not. Mm -hmm. And um, those conversations are really oh. a fantastic career development. I totally agree. Yeah, like all my jobs that I go through, I still go through different jobs that you will hear in another video that we have on me it's also networking or you say information interview a mixture of those and another theme i also hear is volunteerism that most of our speakers actually none of them didn't say they didn't volunteer every one of them say i volunteer and then this volunteer opportunity helped me this way and that way it's that two common thing and then so one Sorry, go right. ahead. I have two thoughts. I want to talk yes. about informational interviewing, but I also want to speak to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Because when I volunteer, I volunteer in a specific way. I don't work for free. Mm. I'm not editing for people for free in the hopes that they will pay me in the future. Mm. That is not what volunteering is about. Volunteering is about getting yourself out there, getting your name and face known. It's about establishing your reputation. Mm. When you work for yourself, I believe your reputation is so much more important than your brand. And people knowing you and people respecting you is key. Mm. So when I volunteer for something like the academic editing chapter that's run by Editorial Freelancers Association in the States and Editors Canada, people get to know what I'm actually like. They get to mm. know how 
bad I am with emails. <laughs> they get to know how I act when I'm stressed out. They get mm. to see my genuine self. Mm. And hopefully they form a good impression of that, I hope, but, but I'm not for everyone, so who knows. And so uh, the idea is that the qualities that I bring to the work that I do as a volunteer, I bring those same qualities to the work that I do as a professional. Mm -hmm. And so I can be relied on to step up in a moment of stress. I can present decently well. <laughs> um, I could give a good webinar if you wanted me to. Mm -hmm. These are things that people know about me because I volunteer. So I agree. Holy echo. That's exactly, I have exactly the same experience on the jobs referral that I get is from my volunteer job. I was doing president of, with the Canadian Mental Health Association. And I started doing strategic consulting with nonprofit. It's just, I didn't ask for this, but people know you because then they know you can. So they asked you for it. So yeah. you're not doing work for mm -hmm. free. This is not about me somebody sending me an editing project and me quietly editing on the couch by myself this is about mm -hmm. doing work for and with other people yes yes and that's that is how i right. spend my time as a volunteer i think this is the best explanation of why volunteer is valuable for for everyone it, this is the best explanation i've heard <laughs> oh don't get me wrong it's absolutely a two-way street yeah. I from other people too. I learn who I can refer. When I get a client coming to me and I go, oh, this is not the right person for me. Maybe they're mm -hmm. doing nano neurochemicals or something mm -hmm. else that I probably just made up and I don't understand their research. I know who to refer to because mm -hmm. I know who's in my network because I know who I've interacted yeah. with. Yeah. Um, yeah, the I, second also, one. I also wanted to say, like, you meet as well people who are more senior than you, mm -hmm. who can help you to rise up, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about you standing out there and being like, oh, I'm the greatest, here's my reputation. You know, it's, it's, it's a real, you build real relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And that's what networking is. It's building professional relationships. Mm -hmm. that, that is very nice to hear. And then you're, but, you're gonna say but I also wanted to talk about informational interviewing. Yes, please, I please. Want, I wanted to say another thing about informational interviews. Look at me. Once you start me talking, I can't stop. Um, That's great. Promise, <laughs> That's what we want. <laughs> I promise if we have coffee, I will listen mm -hmm. to you before I start talking at you. No. Um, about informational interviewing, I wanted to say like sometimes people can feel like those are really extractive, like they're really one directional, like why would this person want to help me out? I'm asking too much. And I used to feel that way. I used to feel like informational interviews were an imposition. And, you know, when I was in my difficult burnout place after I'd, sub after I'd submitted my dissertation, but before I defended it, bad back, broken heart, uh, totally over academia, I had this wonderful phone call with uh, a research grants uh, facilitator who worked at a university four provinces away from me. Mm -hmm. And I'd only asked for 20 or 30 minutes of his time and he gave me over an hour of his time. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that conversation, I said, I feel so grateful and you've given me so much high quality information. Sidebar, the information that he shared with me I used to answer an interview question that I was asked because I had asked mm. him the exact same question. Mm. Um, so I said to him, I feel bad. I can't even buy you a coffee because you're in a different province. Like, you know, I would have loved to have like some way compensated you for all that you've given me. Mm. And what he said in response to that was that uh, the month where I was speaking with him was a particularly difficult time in his job. There was mm. a huge pile of work to do and it mm. was kind of overwhelming and he didn't know where to start. Mm. And he said that having that conversation with me helped him to step back from the day-to-day -day of his job mm -hmm. and think about why he does what he does and mm. why he likes it and what's he, what he gets out of it. Mm. And so that was the compensation for him. That was what mm. he got out of it he benefited mm -hmm. from the conversation too, mm -hmm. even though I felt like I was 
the only one who was really benefiting. Yeah, so it's beautiful. Please don't feel like informational interviews are skeezy or sleazy or mm -hmm. businessy or like you're just mining for a job. These are opportunities to have a real conversation with another person. And if it's a good conversation, neither of you will have wasted your time. Yeah, I totally agree. I do a lot of those information uh, interviews though for, for other people because the business we're in our PhD, right? It's every time I talk to a different person, I learn more about myself. And it really takes my mind away from my crazy job during the day. And it's like, ah, I can relax and talk about what I enjoyed and then share the mistake I've made in the past and then make sure the next person doesn't make the same mistake. And the happiness I, I posted on LinkedIn today, the mentees, your, your mentor's reward is when you tell them you have succeeded. That is right. Thank you for nodding. It's like, please stay in touch. Tell me how you're doing. Like, oh, I got a job. You bring me so much joy when you tell me that. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Right. Yeah. So now do you have any final words, final suggestion for the people who inspired to be you? Um, oh gosh, I feel like I took notes on this and I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> um, I suppose my biggest final recommendation is you're allowed to start. I know that entering a new career doing something like research consulting when you've never done it before, editing when you've not done it before. I have a PhD in poetry. I had to learn a lot before I could market myself as an editor for pay. But at some point you just start. You don't take courses forever. You don't read books forever. You don't delay, delay, delay. At some point you register your business number because that opens so many doors and you just begin. And it can feel like I'm not ready yet, or I'm not X enough, or I'm not Y enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think you possibly are. And at some point you do need to start. Don't start too early. Don't start before you know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. But my experience working with people with PhDs is that many of them feel like you have to read one more book or take one more course before you can start your new career. And I think most of us err on the side of taking too many courses, reading too many books, delaying for too long. Mm. At some point you're starting, you're starting your career. Mm -hmm. That is such a great suggestion. Thank you, because I have so many folks saying like, is there, should I take another course? Should I take a, P, a PMP certification before I start a project management? No. <laughs> oh my gosh, especially if you work for an employer, but even mm -hmm. once you've got your own business number, like if you work for uh, an employer, they will probably have some sort of professional development fund. Let them pay for your certification. <laughs> yeah. You know, Get the experience pay. first. <laughs> my right. business pays all of my business expenses. If I buy, I don't know, this book, or if I buy this book, or if I buy this book, I'm not paying for these things. My business is paying for these things. Get your business number, get started. Don't, don't hold out for forever. Don't feel like you need to have everything lined up first. I have not allowed myself to do any more degrees. PhD is enough. No <laughs> master's in education for me. No more certif certifications or, no, just start. Thank you. Just start. That's gonna be the punchline. Thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of your time today, and I hope you enjoyed this experience as well. Um, yeah. Thank. Thank you so much. We 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 really enjoyed it, and uh, we hope to stay in touch with you as well. Love your work. Love your message. Good luck to everyone who's watching this. If there's anything we can do to be a support, you let me know. Thank you.